The Mosquito Coast by Paul Thoreau. Well, what's masculinity? It's being a leader. It's being courageous. It's being strong. It's being there for uh, the people around you. But what if all of those things get turned up in a really aggressive way? This guy runs roughshod over his family. He's not a protector. He's an idealist. He's a completely and utter secular man. He mocks religion. He mocks these missionaries who aren't the greatest, but they're trying to bring these natives to God. And he is just, going back to at least a couple of your books, it's about someone making the wrong decisions that ultimately ends in tragedy. And I think, I think in our world today, you've got, a lot, you've got this big masculine movement. And, there's, and when masculinity is celebrated, that's, I think that's a good thing and celebrated from a secular standpoint, I think it can eventually turn people into bad things. No different than you can turn bad the other way. Without a godly understanding, go back to your last book recommendation, without a godly understanding of masculinity, we can all go way off the rails. And I think that's what this book is about. Hi, I'm Steve. For nearly 30 years, I've been a pastor and disciple maker. And what I really love doing is helping guys be better followers of Christ and better leaders at home. I'm Mark, a certified financial planner with an MBA and an Ivy League degree who wants to make sure you're making the smartest money decisions possible. And this is Abraham's Wallet. Join us weekly and create a culture in your family of multi-generational prosperity, spiritually, relationally, physically, intellectually, and financially. Run your home and your dough like a biblical boss. We're live. I got an email just before we jumped on here today from a family in Germany. What? That has recently joined the ranks of not only listeners, but supporters of the podcast. So there's people that might even be uh, in different countries listening to us right now, Jeff. And they might they might not have been here for the previous three years of Jeff's book recommendations and admonitions. Uh, so... Why don't you just tell tell the people briefly uh -huh. who you are and how you ended up in this estate where we find you today? Well, y'all held an essay writing contest and I came in second. I, I have known Mark for quite some time, Stephen for even longer, and I live in Denver, Colorado, just south of Denver. I am a communications coach. I work with executives, business leaders, thought leaders. Isn't that a good phrase? Thought leaders, people who think about leading. I don't know what that means. And I help them communicate more clearly, especially when they're giving big speeches, keynote speeches or small speeches. That's what I do. If I had the the wealth to hire Jeff, this podcast would be so much better because you could get me speaking in a more engaging fashion and I could basically be more like you are, which is why mm -hmm. we keep inviting you back to this podcast because you're fun to listen to. So well, welcome, welcome thanks. to Abraham's Wallet. I always, when I'm on these things though, you know, and I say, I'm a communication coach. Well, suddenly I've got to be the best communicator because I'm, and I end up feeling like the fat tennis coach. Like, why would we listen to that guy? Are Smooth. you allowed to be a fat pickleball coach? Is that a, allowable? I think that's all there is. Okay. <laughs> hey, that's not true. Shout out to our friend, Joe Freudenberg, who is a svelte and agile pickleball coach good i don't mean to besmir besmirch pickleballers or joe himself i would never okay. besmirch him not in public you dropped me a note before we jumped on today and said that that was private oh <laughs> uh well the photo was at least <laughs> we're moving on to step two of matthew 18 no uh <laughs> I think that uh, you suggested a little twist on our usual just what books did you like? And you said that your what books pamphlets did you like? <laughs> your book selections this year had a theme. They so did. why don't you introduce the theme? Because I I'm not sure if my books actually follow the theme or if I'm just gonna monkey wrench them into the theme for the mm -hmm. sake of unity and uh, coherence in our podcast here, but I think we're going to run with it. So what's the theme? Gardening. All my books ended up being about gardening. Uh, I was looking through the books of uh, the list of books that I read last year. And can I, th can I throw out a little something? Uh, this, is a, this is a little something. So I've got this list of the books. I have it in an app. And then at the end, I did something new this year. I put, I put a little hyphen and then there's another section of the list. And it was book bankruptcy. 
where I declared at the end of the year booked bankruptcy. Now, I, I've confessed on the pod before that I have a problem. I will read multiple books at the same time. I know that's not good. I've been better at this this year, trying to trying to focus on one book at a time, at least last year. And I feel bad if I don't finish a book sometimes. But last year at the end of the year, I had like five or six books and I thought, I'm not going to finish these. I don't want to finish these. And I allowed myself book bankruptcy and I declared what was book on the, the book bankruptcy list well some of them were some of them were I gosh I wish I could remember exactly um some of them were not just books that I didn't like but I there was one um a Nancy Pearson book that I thought I got what I needed out of that and I don't need to read all of it um, gotcha yeah so anyway going back to my list as I was looking at the list and trying to cherry pick what we would talk about the ones I ended up cherry picking I realized the theme is they're all about men. They're all about guys. They're all about guys in unusual situations, unusual careers. And I think there's sort of lessons to be drawn out of each of these fellas, whether uh, fiction or nonfiction. So that that was my theme. No gardening. I don't think I read a single gardening book this year. I'm sure there's books that are just not about that don't have men main characters. All of my books at least have male leads. And... Most of the romance novels do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Danielle Steele, just she's so good at finding that strong masculine. No. Mm -hmm. I, so I'm going to try to follow you, but why don't you start us off and mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. We'll see where we get with the masculine reading 2023 tick list. In my old age, as I'm aging, I'm finding myself going back to older books that I've read before. I like doing that. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed of that. It's not that they're not making new books. I just like certain books that I've read before. And one of my favorite books I read again this year, and it's by David Howarth. And the book is called We Die Alone. And I don't, I'll be honest, I don't think it's a great title. But this guy, David Howarth, wrote a lot of non, there's a nonfiction book, uh, a lot of nonfiction books about World War II and particularly Norway in World War II. I love Norway. I got to go to Norway about 10 years ago. What a wonderful country. World War II in Norway, that's my sweet spot. Like, I am so fascinated by this. So he wrote a book called The Shetland Bus. He wrote a book called The Sledge Patrol. This book is called We Die Alone. And it's all, and it's the true story. It's, it's one of these, like, it's a crazy survival story. And it's awesome. It's about, I'm going to just set it up. I want everyone to read this. I'm encouraging everyone to read this book. Jan Balstrud was this Norwegian dude, just a regular guy. You look up a photo of this guy, he just looks like a regular guy. And the Germans, by the way, I'm about to besmirch Germans because they were the bad guys in World War II. So I'm sorry to your new listeners, but they've got, to, they've got to know their history, right? They've got to know that these things happen. So the Germans invade Norway in 1940. The Norwegians, they fight back. There's this resistance. It doesn't go so well. Jan Balstrud helps lead some of this resistance. Uh, he's chased out of the country, escapes to Sweden. And when I think about this guy, I think you can go wherever you want. Like you're, you're free. Like just go and go wait out the war. Not Jan Balstrud. Instead, he travels all the way through the USSR, through Africa, through the United States to get to Great Britain because he knows there's a bunch of Norwegians there who are gathering to then go back into Norway to train up the, the, Brit the Brits. They train these guys up for sabotage and then they go back into Norway. That's how devoted these guys are. So Jan Bolstrud goes with a crew of people back into Norway and their goal is like blow up an air traffic control tower or something like that that the Germans have there. Well, when they get there, the team makes this one mistake. They're supposed to meet a shopkeeper who owns a shop and tell him, hey, we're part of the resistance. So close in there. So they go in. They don't know this guy. They just know he's running the shop. They go in there. They go, hey, we're part of the resistance. You want to help us out here? And this guy ends up, he's not that shopkeeper. That shopkeeper sold the shop to this guy. So this guy thinks, oh, this is a test by the Nazis to see if I'll turn somebody in. So he turns them in. So the Nazis descend on these guys, blow up the boat they've gone in on. And now Jan Balstrud has to, he's going in through Norway and it's his survival story. I'll read you, I'll finish with this. I'll read you a little, a little blurb, not from the book itself, but from an article someone wrote about Jan Balstrud's story. What happened over those nine weeks 
remains one of the wildest, most unfathomable survival stories of World War II. I couldn't agree more. Balsrud's feet froze solid. An avalanche buried him up to his neck. He wandered in a snowstorm for three days. He was entombed alive in snow for another four days and abandoned under open skies for five more. Alone for two more weeks in a cave, he used a knife to amputate several of his own frostbitten toes. He spent the last several weeks tied on a stretcher near death as teams of Norwegian villagers dragged him up and down the hills and snowy mountains. We Die Alone by David Howarth. I think the moral of the story is resistance will cost you, but maybe we're tougher than we think. That's good. I want to read it. Yes. Jan Balstrud, just for Balstrud. the listener, he kind of looks like Nicolas Cage. Yeah, I think so. That's what a quick Googling taught me. I think all of my books this year are, except one, uh, most of them are about sort of tragic guy figures, guys who get it wrong and end up suffering for their either foolishness or just external circumstances. It was the year of long books for me. So I didn't read as many books, but I probably read a lot more pages than normal this year. And have you read Wallace Stegner's Big Rock Candy Mountain? No. So it's the story of Bo Mason, who's this rugged baseball player individualist who strikes out across the American West and does... He's always trying to hustle up a fortune and he has multiple boom bust cycles in his life. It kind of ends in tragedy for everyone around the guy. But I thought it was, if you like Steinbeck, this is this is very Steinbeckian in the writing style. So it's it felt like Grapes of Wrath to me. And you just, part of the reason it, it reached out and grabbed me specifically is because it takes place in Salt Lake City. So in the 30s and 40s, it's funny because they'll mention a street and be like, he drove out of town down all the way to 3300 South. And I'm like, that is now still downtown. It's kind of like if you're in Dallas and you talk about going out to the farms in Plano, you know, from back in the 30s. But uh it it's just a very interesting story of a dad that is misfocused i would say on the mission of i need to drum up wealth he i can keep my family on the back burner and let them like what they need most from me is provision and success and then at the very end of the story you find out that was all total bankruptcy and the the son kind of has that light bulb moment go off. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you and tell you it's a happy book, but it's a good book. It's very well written. <laughs> lots of lots of high action moments and there's gunfights and there's baseball games and there's buying casinos in Reno, Nevada back when it was first being developed, stuff like that. So fun book, tragic story of the misguided American father. With gunplay. Yeah. Big with rock candy of, mountain. With a little bit of gunplay. Great. Uh, my next book, let me just say, I finished reading this book on a flight and I found myself openly weeping at this book. The book, I have a copy of it right here if you'd like to take a look at it. It's an, it's an, it's an old book. It's, I think it might even be out of print. I had to get it off a used thing. Moonwalker. Not, not the story of Michael Jackson. Moonwalker by Charlie and Dottie Duke. A man of my age, long in tooth, I've reached a certain milestone. At that milestone at age 50, you're required by law in the Americas to uh, become interested in World War II and the Apollo space program. So I'm hitting both of those. For years, I've loved the Apollo space program, been fascinated by it. And whenever I'd watch documentaries about Apollo 11 landing on the moon, there was always this one moment that, that drew me in. And it's right when Apollo lands, and you hear Neil Armstrong say, uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Well, there's a guy's voice you hear, and he is called the Capsule Communicator at the Mission Control. He's the only guy who is allowed to talk to the astronauts. They don't want 30 voices talking to him. It's this one guy, and he's an astronaut. So they cycle this guy through, whoever is on shift. And the guy at the time of the moon landing was a guy named Charlie Duke. And when he hears uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Uh, Charlie, you hear Charlie's South Carolina drawl say, Roger Twank, he says Twank instead of Tranquility. Roger Twank, Tranquility, we copy on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. And his voice is just so happy and infectious. I always thought, well, who's this guy? And so I 
you know, in my Apollo research, I'd found out, well, it's Charlie Duke. And Duke was, uh, he was one of the youngest astronauts. And when he eventually walked on the moon on Apollo 16, Apollo 17 was the last mission, on Apollo 16, he was the youngest man to ever walk on the moon. And every interview I'd see about the Apollo space program, you know, they're interviewing these astronauts, a lot of them are, you know, Neil Armstrong is just vanilla paper and he's just boring. Buzz Aldrin's kind of interesting. A few of them have some personality. Charlie Duke just acts like, I mean, guys, this is just the great, happiest guy. He's, he's just infectious, happy guy. So I was always interested in him. So I, but I'd heard part of his story on another podcast. And what really fascinating about Charlie Duke is late in life, he became a sold out Jesus lover. And so he referenced his book that him and his wife wrote together. And so it's the story of Charlie Duke and about how he was in U.S. He was at the Naval Academy, then was in the Air Force, went to MIT, fighter pilot, test pilot, became an astronaut, Apollo 11, that was capsule communicator. Apollo 13, sort of a bit of trivia here. You know, if you know the Apollo 13 story, they one of the guys couldn't get on because they thought he might have measles, so they had to replace him. Well, the guy they thought they got the measles from was Charlie Duke. Charlie Duke was part of the backup crew. Apollo 16, Charlie goes to the moon. He's a lunar module pilot. I mean, just massive success for this guy. Comes back to Earth and it's like, I think I'm done being an astronaut. Decides to open up one of the early Coors beer distributorships. Makes a ton of money and then makes a ton of money in real estate. And he's just, he's just everything this guy touches turns to gold. But the problem is his marriage is falling apart. His sweet wife, Dottie, is just dying on the vine. She's becoming an alcoholic. He's never around, even though he's he, he's not like, again, this grim guy. He's this happy-go-lucky golden retriever of a guy. But he's just chasing after all this stuff and can't stay home, really, and interested in his boys, but not really. But he's having success on success on success, but it's all coming up short. And Dottie, his wife, ends up suicidal because she knows their family is doing terribly. And she goes to some church that's just a, a lot of nonsense, like nothing's happening. There's no impact on anything. And I think she goes to a, a weekend a retreat, maybe at the church or something, where they bring in some outside speakers. And all of a sudden, it's she, go, she felt like God going, are you going to take this stuff seriously or not? And she gives her life and she's like, I'm going to give you my marriage. I'm going to give you everything. She gives it all to the Lord. And she has this radical conversion. And then she's looking at Charlie going, I think we need to be going to church more. He's like, ah, I got stuff to do. Ah, da, 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 da. And he's just kind of chasing whatever he's chasing. And Dottie eventually just comes to the Lord and like, will you save my marriage? Will you save my husband? Over and over and over again. And then Charlie has this moment where he falls on his face and comes to worship the Lord and becomes a Jesus follower. And usually those stories end there. It's like, wow, way to go, Charlie Duke. Him and his wife start having these cool, prophetic, healing things, hearing God's voice, having this awesome impact in the world around them. And, you know, Charlie says it's kind of cheesy, but he says it on every every interview, every podcast. He always talks about how he said, you know, going to the moon seemed like the greatest thing, but nothing, nothing in my life uh, has been better than walk. I walked on the moon. Nothing has beat walking with Jesus all my days. I keep, I always have this fantasy that somehow y'all have a connection with him and you're going to have him on the podcast because he'll go, he'll, he'll be interviewed. He's just the sweetest, most wonderful guy. And he loves talking about the moon. He really loves talking about Jesus. Moonwalker by Charlie and Dottie. And if you're listening, Charlie, this is just an open invitation. Come on the Abraham's All podcast. Please, 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 please. I think the moral of that book for us men is success and even positivity. He had such a positive, you know, hey, everything's going to be great. That's not enough. It, it will always, it will all come up short. Sorry, just to put a button on that. So last year when we did this podcast, I had a listener reach out to me and say, hey man, there's a book that it's my favorite book and I totally want you to read it. It's called Matterhorn by Carl Marlantes. Have you heard of this book, Jeff? It is a I think novel. you mentioned it to me. Mm -hmm. So it's fiction. Earthy girthy but carl was at vietnam he he walked around the jungle in vietnam he knew what it was like and he wrote this novel about second lieutenant wayno melas that's a that's quite a fictional name for you wayno sounds like a 
Indiana boy from the farm and Melos kind of sounds like he might be from El Paso. But Wayno, uh, what was his first name? Wayno Melos, or maybe it's Mayas. I don't know. Spell Wayno for me. W A I N O. Uh huh. Okay. Not Wino? Wino. Anyways, Wino, Wayno is a Ivy League graduate who gets drafted to go to Vietnam and wants to kind of prove himself as a soldier. I'm also an Ivy League graduate who wants to prove myself as a soldier, but never had the opportunity. You know, I just think there's something in in every man that not to say we really want to go shoot people and get shot at, but don't don't you believe that there's something in all of us that just wants to know how we would do in that life or death setting? And the the reason this book is recommended to me is it's the the guy who sent it my way said it's the most engulfing, accurate description of what it's like to be in war that I've ever read. And I actually gave this to several people who had been in war and said, well, read this and tell me if that's true. And they all said, this guy, he knows. He knows what it's like because the way he talks is not like somebody who just read a lot of history and knows the facts. This guy talks like somebody who's walked around with a battalion through the jungle wondering if they're getting shot in the next 30 seconds. To me, that's actually the coolest part of the book is you you kind of get to go to Vietnam for a while and it's a long book, but it... It's why I kept kind of just every night like, wow, I'm going to go back and, and, you know, have this vicarious experience again. It also has that unique Vietnam component to it, which is a large part of the book. The Matterhorn that the book is named after is this hill that a large part of the book is the story of taking the hill, losing almost everybody that's in the company. And then literally within 24 hours, getting word on the radio. Yeah, we don't need the hill. You can withdraw and let the enemy take it back because they will take it back within an hour after you leave. And so just that that desperation and the unique pointlessness that I think a lot of people felt that were uh, in the Vietnam War, it definitely comes through in the book. It's a great, if you just want what I've been told is a very true to life war story, Matterhorn. Man, I think I'm sold on that one. Now, probably the most surprising thing you said there was that your uh, your alma mater, University of Central Florida. I did not know that was an Ivy League school. Wayno went to uh, Princeton, so. Oh. All right, my third book. Now, I I, I have a bit of a, a a film and TV background, and it's it's a small one, but a, a little bit of that. And so I like reading film and TV books. And again, this is a book I've read before, but I reread this because I found it such a an interesting biography of a very important man in the history of television. And the book is called Serling, The Rise and Twilight of TV's Last Angry Man by Gordon F. Sander. And the book is all about Rod Serling. And when I was a child, one of my favorite things to do when I was like, I don't know, uh, probably 11 to 13 years old, we lived in Kansas City at the time. I had a little black and white TV in my room. And on Friday nights, late at night on this this little show called All Night Live, where they would show all these old timey shows, they would show episodes of The Twilight Zone. And I loved The Twilight Zone. I thought The Twilight Zone was fascinating. It always had an interesting punchy end to every episode. Well, Rod Serling was the host and they would always cut to him and he had a very distinct way of talking and he's introducing the show while smoking a cigarette. It's a very, very strange man who talked out of the side of his mouth. Well, Rod Serling was the creator of the show. And in fact, anybody who's been in television, you know that like the creators of the show, they'll write a few episodes nowadays. He wrote hundreds of episodes. It was insane how much this man wrote. And so this biography is all about Rod Serling. And it's about his start in t- growing up in Cayuga, New York, and going off to uh, work in radio. And he started writing radio plays. And then he started to write, back in the day, early television would be these play showcases. And so he would write plays specifically for television. And he got to be known as this angry man who was r- r- ranting and raving through his art about... Uh, racism or ranting and raving in his art about greed or ranting and raving in his art about this, that, and the other. And that ended up getting him the Twilight Zone where each episode had some little moral aspect to it. 
And that was Rod's career is he was known as a guy who was going to be countercultural and he was going to push the buttons and he was going to write things that would hopefully make the status quo feel a little uncomfortable and go, yeah, I need to be challenged to something better. Rod's story is interesting because as his life goes on and he died very early, I mean, this man smoked, I, I want to say like four packs a day, maybe more. Um, so he died of, of uh, emphysema or heart disease. Um, he died quite young, but towards the end of his life, he had just kind of started selling out and everything that he had held up as these values, just he started to lose a little bit of that hold on him and it didn't end his life very well, I would say. But you read the book and there's such a, I find it so fascinating that he would have to fight hard to be countercultural with his art. And I was texting our pal, Stephen Manuel, about as I was reading the book and saying, what would it look like for someone today in 2024 to write television or movies that made the populace uncomfortable or really made the entertainment industry uncomfortable? It, back in the day, what he was writing was, we'll think in political terms, he was a liberal and the industry was conservative. So they looked at him and went, no way, pal, no way, pal. And he had to fight, fight, fight. Well, what would it look like? Well, we know the entertainment industry is pushing a lot of progressive ideas out in the world. What would it look like for someone who is in there and very talented to be pushing against that and being countercultural there? That would be a fascinating thing. Uh, that person's blood would be on every page they wrote. Um, but if someone could actually make a mark in that, that'd be, it'd be rare. I, I don't know if we see that much anymore. I think there's guys out there, there's people out there trying that and going for it. But to me, the moral of his story is there is value in creating counter-cultural art. I do believe that there's the, the distinct possibility that we will have Davenport, the the Phoenix reascension of TV's next angry man at some point <laughs> since, you know, I don't think that you're totally done with the entertainment world, Jeff. I think you I'm have nothing if left. not angry, Mark. <laughs> My next book, I think is one that, you know, Tom Wolf, the bonfire of the vanities. Come on, Mark. I'm, I couldn't be more excited. I, it's on my list to reread this year. I, 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 oh, you got me. I'm so excited. So this book is, I would call it like the quintessential novel of New York City in the 80s. Sherman McCoy is your main character. He's a Bond man. He's super successful. He, you know, it's funny to read some of the dollar figures that get thrown around in this book because he's making a million dollars. He's making year. hundreds of dollars. A million dollars a year, still a whole lot of money. But back then, that put you in this upper, rare air, elite New York, whereas today that number is probably, you know, 40 years later, you got to make $10 million a year to afford the type of stuff that he's buying and kind of his lifestyle in this book. But the, the book opens with a scene where our main character, Sherman, is fooling around with a, with a woman that's not his wife, and they get mixed up into an incident where they end up causing an accident that uh, harms a kid in kind of Harlem, I think. I think they're in Harlem. I don't know my Bronx. boroughs that well. The Bronx. Are they in the Bronx? Yes. Okay, they're in the Bronx. And they, they hurt a kid who's black, and there's racial tension in the city. And he thinks, I can just get away with this. I don't think anybody saw me. And then slowly, it becomes clear that he's getting found out for all his lies, not just this accident that he hit and run from, but his affairs and why I think this book was so impactful. I don't know. I mean, this is not a happy thing to talk about, but I've had a lot of people in the past year. Part of the reason that Stephen and I even did that divorce series that we did is because we've had people kind of tell us either they intend to do something that's going to make shipwreck of their lives or that's happening to them or something. And I kind of want to say, like, could I just play this movie out for you and tell you how it goes? And that's what this book felt like to me, is you see a guy who really isn't a bad, like, corrupt dude at the core, but makes some bad decisions, and then they compound. And instead of owning bad decisions, he tries to slip his way out of it, and you just see the the total wreckage of life that comes from it. There's a lot of themes that when I was reading this, I know we weren't in full 2020 
2021 racial tension mode, but a lot of the things that that came out during that time in our country are happening in this book where his race makes him a target where kind of the district attorney says, I just need a rich white guy to make an example of. There's just a lot of, (laughs) I think it's an extended cautionary tale that you just see, oh gosh, the scene where he's with his daughter at the bus stop trying to drop her off for school. And he, it hits him just how the degree to which he has wrecked his family. I think it's okay to read some of that stuff once in a while and go, okay, I get it. Like This is not things to, to mess around with. I'm going to steer very clear of the world of <laughs> cheating, lying, and stealing because this guy dips his toe in all of those things and it's it goes really badly. Mark, it's it's the best. It's it's such a good book. Matter of fact, you described the plot, but the whole other element is Tom Wolfe's writing. Nobody yeah. writes like Tom Wolfe. No one. Uh, if you want a great, very short documentary, it just came out in the last few months. It's called Radical Wolf, and it's all about Tom Wolfe. Tom Wolfe was a character. He was this erudite guy who walked around Manhattan wearing a full white suit. There it is, a full white suit. That was his look. And he was, he was quite conservative. He's from Virginia. He always had a chip on his shoulder about going to an Ivy League school and everybody looking down on him because he had a bit of a Virginia drawl. What a cool dude. And his story of like how he became a, a writer, it, it's crazy. So watch Radical Wolf. Read this book. It's so, it drives some people nuts. People say nobody uses as any, many exclamation points as Tom Wolf. And I'll, I'll tack on, I think one of my books from last year that I recommended, and maybe that's what got you here, is his next novel was is called A Man in Full. And I, I, it didn't have as big a cultural impact, but I would say it's, it's almost as good as The Bonfire of the Vanities. Yeah, I have that in my notes from our last year's podcast. It says so A Man in Full. Read it. So, Don't watch yeah. the movie of the Bonfire of the Vanities. It's no, I mean, literally known as like one of the worst movies ever made. Uh, it's a disaster. It's terrible. It's not good. Read the book. It's a wonderful book. Awesome. All right. Well, you know that uh, every time we do one of these little things, um, I always pretend to have written a novelization of a Sylvester Stallone book. And this year's no exception. And so this year I'm going to pretend like, uh, you know, I, I read the novelization of Rocky Balboa the novelization of the film Rocky Balboa, which came after Rocky five. They gave, they couldn't count higher than five. And so they, they made this movie Rocky Balboa. And so scholastic, they produced a novelization of it for children to teach some of the moral lessons of Rocky Balboa. And so uh, I'd like to read a a short passage uh, from let's hear it. Rocky Balboa by Paul Shipton brought to you by scholastic. I think this is a line that Rocky's delivering to maybe somebody he's mentoring. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. By the way, there's there's clear moral lessons in this. I want everybody to keep an, a keen eye out for. Them. It's a very mean and nasty place. And I don't care how tough you are. It will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. This is not the best Stallone I've ever done. You, me, nobody's going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Right there. How much you can take, keep moving forward. And then there's an exclamation point at the end of this. So I'm going I'm to hit hard. That's how winning is done. Rocky Balboa by Paul Shipton. You'll be moved. You'll you maybe chuckle along the way, but ultimately you'll learn what it means to be a man. I like the Goodreads reviews of the novelization of Rocky Balboa. But Okay, so when, every year when I do this nonsense, I always look up these novelizations and there are people who are passionate about these things. Like they're passionate. And they expect it to be good. They expect the novelization of these movies to be good. 3.5 stars. Stallone is a diamond in the rough. Good reads, good movie. Two words. This is a separate review. Two words. Great book. I feel like if that's your review, this is a perfect novel for you. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I, I like to imagine someone read it and then went, wait, they made a movie of this? Okay. I've got a couple more to touch on. This one... It's Cormac McCarthy's final, one of his final two. So he he died last year, right after releasing these two novels. He hadn't he hadn't put out a novel in almost two decades, but he put out The Passenger and Stella Maris at the same time. And it's the story of Bobby Western, who is a uh, I guess a shipwreck and salvage diver. I love books that reach out and grab you in the first like three pages, like that. 
that is really important to me. That's why I have such a hard time with your favorite author, Kazuo Ishiguro, because he takes like 200 pages to get you interested in the story. But this book is like we're we're diving down in the middle of the night in Louisiana into a a crashed jet. And there's one fewer people in the jet than there's supposed to be. And then we kind of figure out what the heck happened. And we see Bobby Western getting chased around the country by people he never actually sees or knows who's chasing him, but they're they're trying to get him. And we get the story of his psychotic sister, who's also potentially in love with him. And it's I just love Cormac McCarthy. I got to tell you, everything he's written, I've enjoyed. It was important to me to read his last two books. The sister book to this, no pun intended, is the same story from the perspective of the sister. It's called Stella Maris. It's kind of her narrating the story from the psych unit of a mental hospital. I don't recommend that one as much. You you could read this one without that one and be okay. Good old fashioned adventure story with a little bit of like psychedelic, trippy weirdness thrown in to be very Cormac McCarthy. Do you get the feeling he like sort of knew this was going to be his last book? Does it feel like the I don't know his his final final statement? I got to think so. He wasn't a spring chicken. So 1933 to 19 year to 2023, we were 90 years old. So yeah, I, I would imagine he knew that the that he probably didn't have a ton more novels in him. But it's crazy because you would think this is probably the most out there thing he's ever written in terms <laughs> of it's the road or something like that is pretty straightforward, like post-apocalyptic storytelling. This thing... You could just, I I had to read a bunch of authors who wrote about it after I read it to even try to make sense of all the things going on in the book. Hmm. And I could be fooling myself. He could have been a little senile and just kind of lost the plot here and there. But it seems like he was actually kind of leveling up to to another plane on his writing skill in this book. So I liked it. What I have left are lightning rounds. You want to save those for lightning round? Me too. I've just got a couple that I'm going to... Say something about one of which it's probably going to make you talk more than me, but... Oh, geez. Okay, so we'll go back and forth. So a little novella, a short novella called The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Leo Tolstoy. I I see that as the vestibule going into Russian literature. It's a small little thing. It's about a regular man dying. And boy, I I, I don't know why I read it. I just thought, oh, I'll give this a shot. I was so moved by this story and it's about uh, it, it's a tragedy. Obviously it's, 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 a, it's the story of this man as he's dying and all the regrets he has in his life and how he treated his, his wife who was very difficult, even his children, um, how he's looking at death and how he's looking at the normal regular life that he le- led and how uh, rueful he is about it. And there's just this beautiful moment as he's dying, the death of Ivan Ilyich. Have you read this? Yeah, I had to read that one in, in high school. Mm. And it was great. It probably was one of the first Russian lit books that I ever read. And usually when people ask me to this day, what's your favorite book? I'll answer the Brothers Karamazov. I even when I was visiting colleges as a high school student, went and checked out the departments of Slavic languages and literature because <laughs> I thought I wanted to study Russian lit. I liked wow. it that much. <laughs> but this is a great book. And I, I agree with you. It's kind of a gateway drug into the to the really good stuff. You can go Death of Ivan Ilyich, then you can go Crime and Punishment, and then you can get into the really good stuff like mm-hmm. Brothers Karamazov and kind of the War and Peace and some of the big, big stuff. Again, this one is, is I don't, in my little collection, it, it might have been 60 pages. It's very short, but oh, it's effective. Yeah, you can read it in one sitting. Mm-hmm. So if you're trying to to rack up some wins for the 2024 <laughs> right. book list, Death of Ivan Ilyich. You know, it's one of those that it seems like everybody should read it once a year, especially as you get older. Um, just keeping an eye on your life and keeping an eye on your death. Yeah. Masculine Christianity. So this is not a fictional book. It's Zach Garris. We've talked about it on the podcast before. I read that this year. I just wanted to mention it as we talk about books related to men. It's interesting. My wife's reading it right now and we're kind of talking through it. I know that one of the women that has discipled and meant a lot to my wife told her this book was one of the most impactful things I had ever read. It's basically a ground up construction of a theology of gender 
from a biblical lens. And I've been a part of churches where even I had leadership responsibilities and we were trying to figure out things like, what's our position on gender roles in the church and the household and things like that. And I wish I'd had this book back then because it is so... uh, comprehensive. It addresses the counter arguments. He definitely has a position. It's not like a survey. He's trying to argue for one specific position. And I find his position extremely convincing on gender roles. And it's not based on, you know, well, there's these two verses and they say this, so we should either take them literally or not. It's much more about the entire biblical story when it comes to men and women and how they fit into God's plan and how that should inform the way that we operate as men and women in the household, in the church, even in civil government, things like that. So I thought it was really good. And I like that he kind of has a chip on his shoulder and a sneer to his writing. It's not gentle when he discusses his opinion of some of the uh, contrary viewpoints that are out there and being argued for. So my next quick hit is The Mosquito Coast by Paul Thoreau. This was made into a moderately famous good movie starring Harrison Ford back in, gosh, I bet it was probably 85, 86. It's a TV series right now, I think on Apple TV. I've never seen that. The book is great. It's a cautionary tale about a man named Ali Fox, who is a husband and a father. And the story is told from his oldest son's perspective. And it's all about Ali Fox kind of losing his marbles a little, but he's also the smartest guy in any situation. He's an excellent engineer. He's a total secularist. And he decides that America's a mess. It's a disaster. You know what we're doing? We're going to go be, live with the natives. So they moved to South America or Central America, and he's going to help the natives, and he's going to bring them ice. He's, he's created an ice machine, which sounds so strange. The book is a cautionary tale, and I'm going to throw out a controversial phrase here. I think it's really about toxic masculinity. And I know in our world, that phrase has a lot of, oh, careful with that. But I think I think that thing exists. I think toxic masculinity can exist. No different than toxic femininity could exist. We never in a million years talk about that. But I think both of those things can exist. And when I think about Ali Fox in terms of toxic masculinity, well, what's masculinity? It's being a leader. It's being courageous. It's being strong. It's being there for uh, the people around you. But what if all of those things get turned up in a really aggressive way. This guy runs roughshod over his family. He's not a protector. He's an idealist. He's a completely and utter secular man. He mocks religion. He mocks these missionaries who aren't the greatest, but they're trying to bring these natives to God. And he is just, going back to at least a couple of your books, it's about someone making the wrong decisions that ultimately ends in tragedy. And I think I think in our world today you've got a lot, you've got this big masculine movement and, there's, and when masculinity is celebrated that's I think that's a good thing and celebrated from a secular standpoint I think it can eventually turn people into bad things no different than you could turn bad the other way without a godly understanding go back to your last book recommendation without a godly understanding of masculinity we can all go way off the rails and i think that's what this book is about is this guy not being a loving shepherding father or someone who is truly helpful it's really about somebody who is so puffed up with their own ability to change everything that they destroy everything around them including themselves the mosquito coast it's a good book it's a very okay. well written book, and and if if you're like that's interesting, but I want to read it. Watch the Harrison Ford movie. It's true to the book. Well, my last one, it's a one and a half because I've got two. But the this one is one you told me I had to read. The remains I, of the I, day. I've never told anyone they have to read any book unless they're my daughters. Yeah. So the remains of the day, and you love this book. I liked this book, huh. um, and it's the story of a guy who is a butler in kind of a one of the the last great houses that has been passed down and he feels this deep sense of duty to kind of the would you say the craft of butlering yeah. uh, the nobility of his profession and he really sacrifices everything i would say it's definitively a tragedy because he sacrifices everything good in life out of this uniquely 
I will call it British, no offense to our British listeners, but sense of decorum. And he, he actually sees his father die. And there's a scene in the book where his father dies and he continues dinner service during his, his father's passing. And he, he really passes by a lot of incredibly uh, obvious and good things that come his way because he's sort of duty bound to this thing that really doesn't seem like uh, it's as important as he is, has given importance to it. I think that it's an interesting sort of consideration of the topic of duty and honor. I also think it's, you know, in the world where like Jocko podcast is telling (laughs) you to just, you know, grit your teeth and get it done and do it and all that. Like this guy kind of shows the opposite side of that story, which is sometimes you miss out on Mm. life because of sort of an unwillingness to bend at all from what you thought you were going to do. So that's kind of my take on it. What did you, what did you, what makes this book kind of your top five list? Uh, Yeah. Everything you said about it is part of it. Um, I love the writing. I think Ishiguro is a very good writer. I feel like I'm in his head. I think the movie is excellent, by the way, if you're interested in it and you'd rather watch the movie (laughs) with Anthony Hopkins. Uh, you missed out on one of the, to me, one of the most interesting aspects of the book, which is uh, most of this takes place during World War II or lead up to World War II. And Lord Darlington, his boss, is, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, it's not the Stark. He's kind of a Nazi sympathizer or he's in a, at yes. least uh, he's into appeasement. And of course, Stevens, the butler, he's like, look, that's not my that's not my world. I shouldn't question those things. I am just doing my duty. And I don't know, maybe for our listeners, for your listeners, maybe maybe it's a lesson in uh, blind devotion to a corporation. Look, I'm doing my duty. I'm going to put in my years and I'm going to do everything right. And I'm going to provide for my family through this. And, this is, and you get to the end and you go, my gosh, what was I devoted to? And maybe there were some destructive elements to that. I think it's a book about regret. And I don't know, to me, I think in the last couple of pages, there might be a twinge of hope. The title refers to what are you going to do with the remains of the day with what left what's left of your life? Now, of course, at this point, the guy's very, very old. And so there's not a lot left, but maybe he'll do something about it. Yeah, I, I did forget that, that that's probably the coolest storyline of the whole thing is the uh, folly of thinking if I just compromise enough, they'll leave me alone. You know, last year I talked about Gulag Archipelago. It was a book mm-hmm. I had read last year. And the people that didn't do well were the ones that thought, well, if I turn in my neighbors, then the the Bolsheviks will leave me alone. Uh, you know, no. I have to throw it in just as a bonus. This one is the only book that's, I would say, not really about the story of a man. But it's another Ishiguro book called Never Let Me Go. Have you read this one, Jeff? Yes. It's, it I loved this painful. one, and you I'm not going to tell too much. I'm not going to tell too much about it mm-hmm. because part of what I liked so much about it is my wife just said, "Read this. It's crazy. I want your take." <laughs> and you don't find out what the book is about until at least two thirds of the way through. You start going, "Wait a second. <laughs> I think something. I think this is happening." And then by the last ten pages, you go, "Oh my gosh." That is what was happening. It's uh, a heartbreaker. It's, it's a heartbreaker book. It's kind of a dystopian sci-fi, but not not at all science fiction-y no, book. No, it's very subtle. It's very, so very never subtle. Never let me go. It's not very long. So neither of these are mm-hmm. very long. I thought they were both good. Never let me go is more appropriate for a beach read. You don't really yeah. have to think that hard, although you can. It remains of the day is more of a, you're going to need to have your thinking cap on when you read it. I'll be rereading Never Let Me Go this this year. Uh, uh, my last book, quick hit, an odd one. Uh, it's called Something Wonderful, and it's by Todd Purim. It is the story of Rodgers and Hammerstein. Rodgers and Hammerstein were, they wrote some of the most successful musicals of all time. Oklahoma, South Pacific. I, it, 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 I mean, most of the great musicals in American Uh, Broadway history were written by these two guys. And they're just kind of just normal guys. And Rogers would write the music and Hammerstein would write the the lyrics. And I'm not a musical person, but I appreciate musicals. I think when I saw Oklahoma for the first time, I was really enamored of this story and the construction of it. And so this book just walks through these two guys and how they work together well and how they didn't work together well and the success they had, how they dealt with success, how Oklahoma, it sounds so strange guy podcast, but like how Oklahoma was this 
changed everything in Broadway history, how seminal it was, uh, how everything we know about musicals really comes back down to that musical Oklahoma. So what I was really interested, though, is in their dynamic. And I mean, these are guys who are working hard in the 1950s and 1960s. Male relationships were just very, very different. You can imagine how closely these guys work together. And yet at the end of their lives, when I can't remember who died first, but there was this question like, I never really knew how he felt about me. And these guys work together so closely, yet there was not this understanding or depth of relationship. Uh, I also find it just from a creative standpoint, I loved these guys, they would go and, and do a test show in Boston. And after that test show, before it would go to Broadway, after those test shows, they come back to the hotel and go, all right, what do we got to fix? And nobody was precious about anything. We got to cut that number. Well, that number might have been something they had worked on for a year. And they're like, oh, well, if we got to cut it, we got to cut it. And it's gone. And they were they were so devoted to, we're going to make this thing great that nobody had any like, but I really, but I worked hard. Nope. It's the end product that matters. Huh. It, just an interesting story of two men, kind of regular guys. Their marriages were okay. And, you know, there's a lot to learn about, about successful people who you look back and go, I'm not sure your families uh, would say that it was to their benefit that you were so successful. And then there's always in these stories, at least one of them who's like, nothing is never good enough in terms of success. Like they could have the biggest success in the world and they'd still be going, well, what are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? Yeah. What, a, what a weird, sad sickness that is. I'm sure you feel like that sometimes when you do a podcast, you're like, that was the best one. But there's something he's like, no, no, but what's next? Last week, we reviewed the biggest hits from last year from Abraham's Wallet. Oh, um, fun. Our podcast, like in terms of what got the most listens. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't the ones that I liked the best. <laughs> I'm curious to listen to that podcast. I'm sure y'all analyze why, why you think what you think the reasons were for that. Before we hang up, give me one one or two books that you're most that you haven't read before that you're most excited about reading in 2024. Cuz history would suggest that we might find ourselves right back here in January of 25 doing the same darn thing again. God, there's a Russian book called The Master and the Margarita that I'm in Master and Margarita, not The Margarita. It's a woman's name. I'm interested yeah, in that. Yeah, that's on my list too. Really? That's a Jordan Peterson recommendation. Oh, well, there you go. I didn't know that. Malcolm Muggeridge, interested in that guy. He wrote a biography called Chronicles of Wasted Time. Well, a couple things. Uh, Rick Rubin's book, The Act of Creativity. I really am interested in uh, rereading or reading new stuff about Nixon, fascinated by Richard Nixon. I've always wanted to read the sagas of the Icelanders. And then I am enamored of this guy, John Thompson. He's a pastor up in Toronto, and I'm currently reading a book about deliverance ministry by him that is so good, so good. And he's written another book called Convergence about how spiritual gifts work together, and I'm really interested in this cat. I'm about two-thirds of the way done with The Fountainhead right now, oh. and I've never read it, and it's really stinking good. Is it? Um, I didn't know Yeah, I, I think it's so much better than... Uh, uh, Atlas, Atlas shrugged. shrugged. So I'm loving it. Other stuff that's on my list. Uh, my wife bought me the book SPQR, which has evidently been all the. It's been a bestseller, and it's about the Roman Empire. Uh, <laughs> so it's a history book, but supposed to be really good. And have you read A Fine Balance? That's on my list this year too. Uh, and I, what is it? It sounds vaguely. It's familiar. an Indian novel. Nope. Uh, I don't know too much about it, except my wife also handed that to me and said. You'll go, you're going to read this and you will love it. So I, I do. I read some Indian novels last year that I liked. Other than that, Demon Copperhead is on my list. New Barbara King Solver book. My wife uh, read that. She said it's 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 rough. It's rough. Our boy Amor Towels is publishing a new book this year. Is he? Uh, it's a collection of stories, which I'm always like. That usually is like what authors do to sort of provide a little extra income between real books. No, to fit to to write out a contract. Well, he's publishing another novel in 25. Oh, so okay. we're gonna get a collection of stories in 24 and a novel in 25. You just want a more towels. You just want a few more towels. I think he's the best writer of our time, Jeff. What about Cormac? Well, he, he his time is over. <laughs> As he's dying, he's uh, he's passing the mantle to a yeah. more towels. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh huh. So yeah, that's my. I I did read a book that's like super short called Lust of the Flesh. That's on. It's kind of a response to Christians that would say there's nothing inherently sinful about temptations towards a specific sin. So he he kind of wrote it. I think responding to those who would say like you can call yourself a gay Christian. There's no no issues with that. It was really really encouraging to me in ways that I did not expect. I thought it was just going to be more of a theological argument against like kind of popular progressive Christian theological storyline. But what it ended up being is much more of a call to purify all the way down at the roots of any sin, not just lust. So I thought that was really good by a guy named Jared Moore. I sure enjoy this. I hope I hope your your listeners enjoy this. I don't know. I think it's good to read. Yeah, yeah we have made it to the that. end of another Tied best books or best books about men of 2023. That sounds weird. I, this might be the only best books about men of 2023 podcast that you'll find. So please like, subscribe, uh, give us five stars on iTunes and Spotify. And, uh, four or five. I think four yeah. or five is fine. If you send us book recommendations, we might even read them and talk about them next year. Oh, or if you send us books. By the way, isn't that the worst? Somebody, when somebody, you're like, here's a book. You're like, oh, here's an assignment. Yeah, it can be either way. It's either awesome or it's like, huh, now I'm going to have to talk about this with you and I didn't want to read it at all. Um, If it comes from a trusted source, it's a great thing. Stephen Manuel for Christmas got me a book that I was very, I'm like, oh, this will be good. And now that I'm looking forward to. Sometimes people give me books, it feels like. You know, my wife has a track record of giving me books that I'm not excited about when I get them. And I always like them. (laughs) So I've sort of learned to just stop being not excited and go, you know better than me, I'm reading it.